than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and Today is the last lecture before the midterm. It's going to be about uh, query execution part two. Remember last week we started uh, query execution part one. So um, we're, going to, we're going to pick up with that today. Uh, but of course, as usual at first, we're going to start with uh, the administrative stuff. So uh, project number two is going to be due this Sunday, October 17th uh, at 11.59 p.m. as usual. Homework number three is going to be re released today. It's not out yet, but we're going to post it um, by the end of the day today. And that is going to be due uh, on Sunday, October 24th. So both of those are, of course, due after the midterm, uh, which is the next uh, uh, item on the agenda here. And the midterm is going to be this Wednesday, so in, in just a, a couple days, October 13th. It's during regular class time uh, in this room. Um, it is open book, open notes, as I mentioned last time. Uh, so any you know paper material you want to use is fine. Um, again, please try to you know not. Uh, you, technically, you can walk in here with a, a wheelbarrow full of uh, printed papers, but please don't don't uh, kill the environment too much with this stuff. Um, but again, any any of the the slides or or um, textbook or any notes you have. Uh, just no electronic devices, please. So uh, computers, iPads, phones, that kind of stuff. Um, you, you are allowed to have a calculator, as I mentioned, uh, because there, there may be some um, questions about uh, computing logs on the exam, unless you can do logs easily in your head. That's also fine. Um, but uh, the, the, the material covered is going to be everything up to and including today, so everything uh, in lectures number one through number 12. Uh, and again, if you check out the Piazza Post, there's more details uh, about everything. And I, I've also allocated some time um, at the end of today's lecture. If you have any questions about uh, the, the exam, or uh, databases in general, or just life advice, uh, whatever you want to talk about at the end, there's, there's some time built in uh, today to do that. Okay, so uh, are there any, any questions about administrative stuff or scheduling here? Uh, and then also at the end, there will be more time if you have specific questions about uh, exam stuff. Okay. So, uh, jumping right in, query execution. So last class we talked about um, query execution and we discussed sort of how uh, we can compose operators together into some kind of uh, plan to, to be able to allow our DBMS to execute an arbitrary query. So again, remember that we go from sort of this uh, you know, SQL query which gets translated to a logical plan, so something with these you know, abstract operators uh, shown here. And then finally to a physical plan, which uh, describes how we're going to uh, specifically execute each operator, so the, the physical implementation of each operator. So again, just continuing the example from uh, previous lectures, we have this, this SQL query here, which is just doing a simple a join on, on two tables R and S um, on the ID column with some simple uh, selection predicate on S dot value, and then we're returning R ID and uh, S dot C date. So uh, translating that query written in SQL into a plan, a logical plan looks something like what's shown here, where we have a base, a base table scan over uh, each of the relations, R and S. There's some filtering that's going on on S with the selection operator, and both of those are fed into the join operator. Uh, again, here we don't say which join operator we're going to use. We could be using uh, a hash join operator, a sort merge join operator, you know, any block nested loop uh, join operator. So again, this is just at the, the logical level. And then uh, finally, we're, we're uh, applying the projection at the end to, to filter down to just the attributes I want to return to the user. So sort of throughout this uh, discussion of how to execute this uh, plan that we have here, we've sort of been so far assuming a single worker thread uh, or a single worker which could be implemented as you know just one thread. So 
in, in today's class, we're going to discuss specifically how we can generalize this execution to uh, multiple workers. So we have, you know, in, in our system we've discussed, uh, we have potentially multiple CPU cores, um, a bunch of uh, uh, concurrency available to us. We want to take advantage of it by figuring out how to parallelize, take this plan, which so far we've only discussed uh, sequentially and parallelize it and make it run uh, concurrently to utilize all of the CPU resources we have. So sort of just to, to start, um, you might wonder like why do we care about parallel execution? Well, uh, there, there are a few different parts to this answer. The first um, comes at, at the system level, so inside our DBMS, uh, parallel execution can give us increased performance. So that can be measured in one of two ways. We can get increased throughput which means that you know, we can uh, execute uh, more queries um, in our system because we, we are taking advantage of all of the uh, concurrent resources that we have. We can have you know, more parallelism, more uh, queries concurrently executing. Or on the other hand, if we are talking about speeding up a single query, um, we can reduce the latency of that query so that the time uh, uh, from invoking the query, submitting the query, in, until we start getting uh, the answers back that we, that we uh, are interested in. So there are kind of these two dimensions depending on, on which uh, app or what, what the um, specifics of your application are. So if you have something that's like a transactional workload, uh, you might care more about throughput where you want to, we have a lot of concurrent transactions coming in, you want to uh, execute as many as you can so you have a, a higher throughput, or if you're more on the analytical side, like uh, online anal analytical processing, OLAP, then you might care about query latency. If you have a really long running query, you want to try and um, complete it as quickly as possible. So that's sort of inside the system, but from uh, the, the external perspective, what some of the users of your uh, application might care about are increased responsiveness and uh, availability. So what they're seeing, you know, if you have a, if you have a web page uh, that is sort of like an online storefront for your uh, application, then the users, users kind of can see increased responsiveness. You can handle higher user load, um, page time, load, page load times might be faster, that kind of stuff. So this is sort of the, the, the first thing, increased performance might, might um, be visible inside the system, but from the external perspective, we care about sort of this, uh, what, what the user sees. And then finally, the last piece, uh, which doesn't get talked about a whole lot, but I, I also think is important, um, is that if you're able to effectively leverage parallelism, um, then you, you might end up with a, a potentially lower total cost of ownership. So it's you know, the entire uh, money that you spend on, on your DBMS deployment. If you can effectively leverage all of the parallelism that the hardware provides to you, you may be able to use fewer machines uh, to support your application. Uh, you may be able to be more energy efficient, for example, if you're, if you're able to complete queries uh, faster. So all of these sorts of things kind of factor into this idea of how much money you're spending on your um, uh, database deployment. So kind of one, one thing that um, we need to define in advance is sort of the, the difference between when we talk about parallel execution um, versus distributed execution. So parallel execution, um, I mean, is, is more broadly speaking, how we're going to take a single query that executes uh, sequentially or serially and then split it up to make it run concurrently. Distributed execution is specifically is talking about one specific case. But first, sort of I want to point out um, that uh, they, they share a lot of uh, similarities in the way that we think about them. So um, in, in both a parallel and a distributed setting, database, the database is spread out across multiple resources and we'll define exactly what resources mean, but I think about hardware resources, things like CPUs, uh, disks, machines, uh, could be servers in a rack, could be multiple um, data centers, those sorts of things. So you have this sort of pool of resources and in both cases, a parallel and a distributed setting um, the, the database is, is somehow spread out across multiple of these resources. But the important piece is that, again, in both cases, um, we want the database to appear as sort of this single logical database instance to the application. So 
regardless of, of what's going on in the background, regardless of what we're doing with, um, you know, it could be spread across multiple disks, multiple machines, multiple data centers, whatever. Uh, we want this to be completely transparent to the application. We don't want the application to have to know or care about uh, kind of the, the physical organization behind the scenes uh, in the DBMS. Because if you think about kind of way early in the, uh, the, the class, um, one of the first lectures, we, we talked about kind of the, the nice properties of uh, SQL being declarative and, and abstract to some, some extent. So you don't have to care about uh, sort of the low level implement de implementation details. You just you know, write a query that specifies what you want rather than how exactly to go about getting it. So we don't want the application or the SQL queries we write to have to know about sort of the, the parallel or distributed setting behind the scenes. Um, that, that should all be abstracted away and managed by the DBMS. So those are the similarities um, in, in, at a high level, sort of a lot like, like uh, abstraction similarities. Um, these are a few concrete differences between these two settings. So parallel DBMSs, when we think about parallel execution on a single machine, um, we're think typically thinking about resources that are physically close to each other. So if you have multiple cores or if you have multiple CPUs, um, a multi-socket um, machine, they're all physically located close together in one sort of uh, hardware um, deployment. Uh, the, the resources typically communicate over high-speed interconnects or they have you know, uh, uh, shared memory. They can all access the, sh the same shared memory or the same disk, that sort of stuff. And uh, the, the communication is assumed to be cheap. So, you know, relative to me having to make a, a remote call to another uh, machine in another data center or something, um, all, of, all of the kind of inter-core or local communication in parallel DBMS is, is uh, extremely cheap. And the other, the other important point is reliability. So, you know, if I, if I uh, read or write from some memory region, um, I expect that, that to be, uh, uh, you know, safe and, and managed at the level of the OS for the hardware. So uh, if, if there are, um, you know, local communication between cores, then I expect that that, that communication is going to happen as, as uh, I'm told it should. On the other hand, uh, distributed DBMSs, we typically think about the resources being uh, potentially very far from each other. So, I mean, you could think um, at, at, a, at a smaller scale, machines in the same rack, you still have to you know, communicate over um, uh, network. Uh, but you know, on, the, on the other extreme, you could have uh, data centers located in different regions around the world. So you could have you know, one data center uh, here, you could have one data center in Europe, one in Asia, et cetera, um, and, and all of these sorts of things, making distributed calls to each other are very expensive. The latency um, just in the network round trip is, is large compared to local communication. Um, the, the, the other kind of big differentiating factor, uh, other than the cost, you know, slow communication, uh, is problems that come up. So faults uh, or uh, faults that occur in, in communication, it's important for our applications, the DBMS, to be fault tolerant. So, for example, if you have you know, network partitions or uh, dropped or lost packets or that kind of stuff uh, in, in um, inter data center or inter node communication, then uh, you can run into problems with the correctness of your application. So you need to be careful in constructing uh, systems to be able to tolerate faults at, at that scale. Whereas in parallel DBMSs, we're typically not thinking about faults uh, that can occur like that. So uh, fault tolerance is going to be a big, a big piece, uh, bo both fault tolerance and um, distributed communication avoiding or avoidance are going to be a big piece of the distributed DBMSs piece uh, which I think we're going to talk about later in the semester, but just for uh, uh, t today's class and for what you need to care about for the, the midterm, we're going to be focusing on, on the parallel um, execution in a single hardware platform. So I just wanted to kind of you know, set up the, the logical similarities between parallel and distributed databases, but also these important differences. And again, we're going to be focusing today on the, the parallel uh, execution case. So 
Today's agenda specifically, we're going to talk about um, process models, how we, how we handle the uh, concurrent workers in our system, um, how we can achieve execution parallelism using a, a particular process model, and then um, at the end, talk a little bit about how we can also achieve IO parallelism. So the first piece is gonna be really about how to break up um, a, a query's execution into multiple different concurrent pieces. The second uh, IO parallelism part is gonna be about how to leverage uh, uh, disk or, or other storage media for, uh, uh, how, to, how to leverage parallelism from, from uh, disk. So uh, before we get into this, are there any questions kind of about the high level differences between parallel DBMSs or um, uh, parallel, uh, sorry, parallel DBMSs, parallel execution or distributed DBMSs? All right, so the first piece is uh, the process model. So what is a process model? Um, the, the DBMS's process model specifically defines how uh, the, the system that we're building is architected in order to support concurrent requests from uh, multiple users that can be concurrently accessing the DBMS. So uh, specifically, I, I wanna focus on this term worker. Um, sometimes I think throughout you know, the past lectures I've been interchangeably saying worker, thread. Um, as we'll see in a second, it's, it's not necessarily always a thread, uh, but basically the, the worker abstraction is just think about a worker as like the, the component in, a, in our DBMS that's going to be responsible for executing a particular task, and we'll talk about what those tasks look like uh, in a few slides, but executing a particular task on behalf of the client and then returning the results to the client. So um, the, the process model is going to define specifically how we uh, think about or implement these, these workers in our system. So there's gonna be three different approaches that we're gonna talk about. Uh, the first is uh, one process per DBMS worker. Uh, the second approach is to use uh, what's called a process pool, and the third approach is to use threads. So uh, th this is kind of what, what I was getting at when I mentioned that um, I, I wanted to make this distinction between uh, what I was sort of loosely referring to as a thread or, or worker in the past and, a, and a, uh, an actual worker component. So uh, in approach number one, the, the process per worker, you can think about it, um, each worker is a separate OS process, really simple. Um, essentially, we're gonna rely on the uh, OS scheduler here to, to um, schedule our, our process when it's running. And we're going to use things like shared memory for global data structures and inter-process communication. So uh, the, the sort of nice thing about this model is that if a process crashes, it's not going to, to break our entire system. Uh, if we have multiple processes running, one to handle um, each, each client connection, then uh, if, if one of them fails for some reason, uh, it could be some really rare hardware failure, it could be a, a bug in our code, uh, of course, we don't uh, have bugs in our code, but if, if there were a bug in our code, um, then maybe like a, a divide by zero problem or a, a, if you read an invalid memory location or something like that, uh, then having that process crash uh, won't break the entire rest of your system. So you have a single, single um, uh, worker process crash, everything else can keep running uh, fine, as long as, of course, they don't encounter the same error that ca caused your first uh, process to crash. So uh, sort of how, how this works uh, at, at a high level is imagine we have some application over here on the left and we have this uh, uh, layer called the dispatcher layer where basically uh, the application is going to submit its request, you know, the query, whatever it wants to have executed to the dispatcher layer and then the dispatcher uh, is going to, to sort of uh, fork off a new process specifically to handle this uh, application's query. So now, um, as I said, this, this worker is going to sort of manage all of the uh, logic needed to execute the query from the client, and it's going to communicate back and forth the results back to the client. So sort of this, this worker process is going to manage all of the, the reads and writes and the different query operators uh, that we need to execute against the database, in order to uh, get the answers that we need back to the client. 
So this is uh, sort of the, the, um, uh, the, the processing model taken by uh, several of these uh, systems here, IBM DB2, Oracle, Postgres. Uh, does anyone have a guess why these systems use um, this, this you know, process per worker approach rather than you know, either of the other two, the, for example, the, the threading based approach? It's, it's, uh, it's because they're old. Uh, so if, if, you, if you think about when these systems first came out, um, you know, the, the 80s or early 90s, um, th there wasn't really a, a, a portable threading library like, uh, you know, pthreads that's available and kind of, you know, the common standard today. So if, if these uh, systems wanted to execute on, on a bunch of different platforms, then uh, they would kind of have to re-implement some threading implementation one off for each. So instead, they, they've kind of went this uh, process-based approach um, which, which required less uh, uh, difficulty switching between uh, the different platforms they were interested in. So that's, that's uh, sort of why they have this, um, what you might think of as a, a legacy architecture compared to, to uh, newer options. So uh, the, the, the second uh, approach we have here is called the process pool approach. Uh, basically, I mean, you can think about it, it's the same as the previous one, we're still using processes to handle clients, but uh, rather than sort of, you know, forking a new process for each um, client that connects to the dispatcher, we essentially allocate this worker pool of processes. We have a bunch of processes hanging out in our pool. And um, when, when one of our requests comes in, uh, the dispatcher can, can route it to uh, any free worker uh, process in the pool. So this is still gonna rely on the, the OS scheduler um, in, in shared memory or some uh, inter-process communication uh, mechanism to, to communicate between them. Um, and it, it can also be sort of bad for a CPU cache locality um, because you know if if we don't have any control over when processes are being scheduled, descheduled, uh, or swapped out, you know there's just this pool kind of kind of working on on the different uh, queries that we have in our system. There's no way for us to control um, kind of what is running concurrently. So these these different processes could be you know thrashing essentially in the, the uh, CPU cache. So uh, examples using this approach, um, I mentioned you know, DB2 in the, the previous slide, uh, kind of more recent iterations have, have moved towards this architecture as has uh, Postgres. So in, in newer versions of Postgres since 2015, I think, um, they, they sort of have this, this worker pool uh, approach. So the, the final one, and I think uh, this has you know, become within the last, we'll say 10 years, um, the, the dominant approach, and I think most new systems that are being built from scratch are um, taking this approach, but uh, th the idea is rather than using processes, we're going to use a, th a single uh, a th thread for each worker. So uh, we have one process running, that's our DBMS process, and um, what we do is we, we spawn up multiple threads uh, for each individual worker. So the, the DBMS, in this case, is going to manage its own scheduling and can schedule uh, how many threads, which threads uh, I want to use, that kind of stuff. Um, and the, kind of the, the trade-off you're making here is that in this case, a thread crash might, might cause your entire uh, process to crash. So there's not kind of this isolation anymore where uh, if you know, one, of our, one of our processes fails, then you know, the rest of our system might be able to continue executing. In this case, you know, you, you could run into a case where one thread crashing causes your, your whole DBMS process to crash. So there are all sorts of systems. Uh, this is just a, a few. Um, many of the systems coming out in, in academic research also uh, use this, this model. Uh, there's, there's kind of a lot um, lower overhead to using threads than uh, uh, processes. The, the cost of a context switch between threads is a lot lower than uh, switching between processes. So, um, sort of just to, to, to wrap up, 
uh, the discussion of, of the different process models. Um, the, the, again, to, to reiterate what I just said, uh, in, in the, the multi-threaded architecture, um, there's less overhead per context switch uh, if you're switching between different threads versus switching between different processes. Um, and you don't have to worry about dealing with shared memory anymore. Um, they, they're all, uh, they, they, they don't have to communicate just through that mechanism. So um, the, the, the key piece to remember here though is that the thread per worker uh, model doesn't mean that the DBMS is going to necessarily support what's called intra-query parallelism. So if you think about uh, a query, there are many different ways to, to parallelize the query, and we're gonna talk about sort of uh, all the different options we have at the system design level. But just because we, we uh, can have multiple threads um, running or multiple processes running in our system doesn't mean we can take a single query and split up its execution into multiple different parallel pieces. So we may be able to support um, you know, uh, multiple concurrent queries from, from completely different users. So uh, you know, I, I, let's say I issue a query to the system and you also issue a query to the system, then uh, you know, we, can, we can have one thread or one worker um, that's managing each of those independently. But uh, in terms of being able to split up or parallelize a single query, just because we have this, this uh, multi-threading or uh, multi-worker model doesn't mean that we can, we can parallelize that one single query. So are there any questions kind of at, at a high level about the different uh, process model options that we have? All right, so uh, one last note about kind of scheduling. Um, for, for each query plan, the DBMS has a lot of things it needs to decide. It has to decide you know, where, when, and how it's going to execute that query plan. Uh, that could mean you know, how many tasks we're going to break down the plan into, how many CPU cores we should use, uh, what CPU core should a particular task be executed on. Executed on. For example, I mentioned like you could have um, uh, cache cache thrashing or cache trashing in, in, uh, if, you're, if you're swapping between um, different uh, uh, tasks that, you want, that are kind of competing for, for what's being used in the CPU cache. So if there may be um, better to schedule tasks on one CPU core or two tasks running concurrently that can share resources. Uh, if you have like uh, NUMA regions, which are, we're not gonna talk about in this class, but uh, if you have uh, uh, tasks that are primarily executing uh, or primarily accessing data stored in one NUMA region in memory, um, it may be beneficial to schedule it on a particular CPU core. Um, and finally, kind of where the task should be storing its output. Again, uh, NUMA considerations, all that kind of stuff. But the, the, the high level takeaway here, and this is the important piece, uh, and this has been reiterated several times throughout the course when we talked about kind of disk I.O. and memory management and all that stuff. Um, the DBMS always knows more about the application that's running and what it wants to execute than the OS. So kind of any time, including in this case, scheduling our tasks where we can uh, apply higher level knowledge about what our application or our queries or whatever we're trying to execute is doing, we can always make better or more optimized decisions than if we just left scheduling up to the OS. So that's kind of the high level takeaway from, from uh, a, a system design perspective. Again, the DBMS knows more about what it's trying to run so it can do a better job scheduling than the OS can. And I apologize to any OS people if you're, you know, lifelong dreams to be an OS researcher, uh, sorry. But uh, in, in this case, in, in these particular applications, um, it's, 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 I think, pretty clear that, that the DBMS um, always has, you know, by virtue of having more information, it can do a better job um, on this sort of stuff. But OSs are still, of course, very important. So um, the, the next thing I want to talk about uh, is kind of the different types of parallelism. So I mentioned that we, we can have different types of parallelism um, uh, when we're thinking about how to split up the different sub-pieces of a query. And the two main ones that we're going to talk about are uh, what's called inter-query parallelism versus intra-query parallelism. So the first inter-query parallelism um, means that the, the uh, queries are going to be executed uh, concurrently. Different queries can be executed in a multi-user environment. We have all these different queries coming at the system. They can get executed 
um, at the same time and you know in for example if we're if we're assigning one uh, process to to each query or one thread to each query whatever uh, we can have all these queries running at the same time and they they don't need to block each other so this is again going to increase uh, the, th the throughput of our system we can have if we have you know eight cores or 16 cores or something we could have potentially um, eight or 16 or maybe even more uh, uh, concurrent workers running it's going to give us a lot more parallelism than if we only had one uh, similarly we're going to be able to reduce latency for individual query executions because now rather than you know having to potentially if we have uh, one query come in and then another and another uh, you know to execute the nth query in that queue assuming we're going to process them all serially uh, we're going to have to wait around for potentially you know long time until uh, our query finish gets gets to the front of the queue where it can can execute so you can you can substantially reduce latency by by allowing more queries um, to execute concurrently. So that's kind of the the, the basic one. And I, I mentioned that um, again, this the second piece, which is trickier to think about, is if if we want to take a, a single query and split it up into a bunch of smaller tasks and have those execute in parallel, uh, that's that's a lot harder to do. And just because your system supports um, concurrency or, or a multi-worker environment doesn't mean that you can have uh, this this second type of parallelism, intra-query parallelism. So it's not it's just because you ha you have the ability to to have multiple threads or uh, workers doesn't mean you can do this second piece. And it's going to take careful system design in order to be able to do it. So again, the the main benefit of the second one is that you can decrease the latency for really long running queries. If you have an analytical query or something being able to split it up into a bunch of smaller pieces could save you a lot of time. So um, kind of this is just a, a, a summary of, of sort of everything I, I just said uh, about interquery parallelism. Um, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, interesting bits are, are the bottom pieces. So if, if the queries are read only, then it requires relatively uh, little coordination between them. Uh, I mean, we, we still have to care about, you know, what what uh, pages we're reading from disk or what's in our buffer pool, that kind of stuff. But uh, in terms of we don't have to worry about concurrent updates or something, right? We don't have to worry about race conditions. Uh, we don't have to worry about any of that stuff that happens. If everyone's just reading, then nothing's going to change uh, in the interim while our query is executing. Now, if multiple queries are updating the database at the same time, then it's it's sort of hard to, to do correctly. And there's going to be, um, I'm not sure how many lectures, I know multiple, uh, but we're, we're gonna start talking about this in, in lecture 15. So uh, this is gonna be after the midterm. Uh, don't don't worry about this for, for Wednesday, but sort of, um, you know, just keep it in the back of your mind that when, when we're doing these sort of concurrent updates, uh, we have to be careful about how we're, we're scheduling them and the mechanisms we use to make sure that there aren't errors that come up during query processing. So intra-query parallelism, uh, as I said, can improve the performance of a single query by taking each operator and breaking into smaller tasks that we can execute in parallel. So you can sort of think about this paradigm uh, in terms of like a producer-consumer model. So each operator is uh, potentially, you know, the, the child operators are producing outputs that are going to be consumed by their parent operators, and those parent operators are potentially also producing outputs that are going to be consumed all the way up to uh, the root node of the tree, which is when we get to the end, we want to return a result to the user. So you can kind of uh, think about each, each operator in sort of this producer-consumer paradigm. Now, uh, all of the operators that we've talked about, uh, selections, joins, projections, sorts, all that stuff, uh, there's, there's a parallel version of the operator, parallel algorithm that we can use to break up uh, the, that operator into multiple smaller pieces. So uh, there are sort of two different ways that, that we can um, implement this. One is to have all of our concurrent uh, uh, workers accessing some centralized data structure. So imagine like a, uh, if you're doing a hash join, for example, you build some sort of big concurrent hash table that, that all of the workers that we're having run concurrently are uh, 
writing to or uh, updating potentially or reading from at the same time. So sort of this, it's this sort of shared data structure that all of our workers can access. The other um, option, and we'll see several examples of, of how this looks, is to use some kind of partitioning scheme to divide up the work. So there are a lot of cases where uh, we, we don't necessarily need to have one shared data structure that all of the workers are accessing. We can sort of split it up, partition it into these disjoint pieces that can be worked on uh, completely separately in parallel. So sort of like an embarrassingly parallel um, uh, setting. But the problem is at the end of the day, we, we need to kind of merge or combine together whatever uh, parallel outputs we produce. So if we do have, if we don't take the first approach, we'll say we want a, a, you know, a, a group by or something. If we use the first approach, we have a, a hash table that all of our workers can write to concurrently, update concurrently, and at the end we have one hash table to give the answer back to the uh, application. If we, if we take this partitioning approach where we split everything up, now we have all these different partitions, we can't tell our application, okay, well, uh, you know, it's, we have 16 workers in our system, so you're gonna get back 16 disjoint pieces. We need to sort of um, abstract this away so that the user or the application doesn't care about the, the low-level implementation details. It should look to the, the user like everything's running on uh, single-threaded or, or one worker um, query execution. The, the user doesn't need to know about the, the parallelism. So in this partitioning case, um, uh, we're, we're going to need to be able to recombine the results at, uh, at the end of the, the query execution. So we'll see uh, examples of how that looks in, in uh, a few slides. So just as an example, uh, so you have some concrete uh, thing to look at here. Uh, as an example of intra-query parallelism is uh, the, the parallel grace hash join. So remember the grace hash join we talked about uh, we sort of do a, a scan on R and a scan on S, and we, we do this partitioning phase, and we split the uh, tuples into these this disjoint partitions using our H1 hash function. And then for each one of these partitions, we only have to do a join uh, between, you know, for, for R, we only have to do a join between um, partition zero uh, with, a, with partition zero of S. Partition one of R with partition one of S, we don't have to sort of look through all the partitions. It's just going to be each um, key is mapped to a disjoint partition from each of these tables. So if you think about how this would look in, in some kind of parallel setting, um, we could do something like this where we have all of our, our separate workers uh, and each worker, let's say, is going to take a, a, a disjoint partition of this hash join. So for example, you know, our, our first worker up there could get partition zero, and all of the other workers can do their local join um, uh, without having to worry about what's going on in, in worker one with partition zero. So they, these can all happen in parallel, and we have no uh, coordination problems. Now again, um, as I mentioned, we need to figure out how we're going to, to recombine all these uh, results at the end. So each, each worker is gonna do its own thing, it's going to do its local join on its disjoint partition, but then we need to stitch them all together at the end to give an answer back to the user. So um, at a high level, there are sort of these three different um, options for intra-query parallelism, how we, how we implement it. Uh, approach number one is what's called intra-operator or horizontal uh, parallelism. Approach number two is inter-operator or vertical parallelism. Those will make more sense uh, why they're called that in a second. Approach number three is called uh, bushy parallelism. Uh, as far as I can tell, bushy parallelism is sort of like a, a combination of, of the first two. Um, I, I think it, it shows up in the textbook, but I, basically I think y you just think about it um, like we're, we're doing a hybrid approach of uh, approach number one and approach number two. So um, the important thing to remember here is that these techniques aren't mutually exclusive, and I guess that's what the, the bushy uh, approach shows, but um, the, the, the DBMS is sort of left to figure out how it wants to execute any given individual query using any combination of these uh, uh, techniques. So um, I think horizontal partitioning is probably, the, or sorry, horizontal parallelism is probably the most um, common, so we'll talk about that one first. Um, 
So basically what we're going to do is for each of the operators that we have, you know, a selection, a join, projection, aggregation, whatever, uh, we're going to decompose each of those operators into independent fragments or the subtasks that are, are going to perform the same functions, so do the same thing on different disjoint subsets of the data. So the, the key is disjoint subsets. So we, we want each query, or sorry, we want each uh, fragment to process some disjoint subset of the data that the query is accessing. So if we can, if we can set that up so that they can all execute um, on disjoint subsets, then we don't have to do any coordination between them while they're running. So um, basically the, the, the high level abstraction here that we're going to uh, inject into the, the query plan is what's called an exchange operator. Uh, and this is part of the volcano um, processing model. Uh, basically it's, it's a, a uh, high level abstraction that DBMS is going to insert um, into sort of like a dummy operator into the uh, query plan that's going to be responsible for just coalescing or splitting up results from multiple uh, child or parent operators. So for example, if you have a bunch of child operators that are uh, split up into these different fragments, we insert an exchange operator uh, that's going to, to coalesce them, group them all together for the next operator in the, the query plan. Similarly, um, if you, if you are, um, need, to, need to split up the, the uh, result of, a, of an individual operator so that you can have parallelism across uh, multiple workers, it's the same thing just in the, the outgoing or output uh, side. So uh, as a concrete example of this, let's take a look uh, at, at this really simple query here. So we're just selecting everything from A where some uh, value is greater than 99. And it's a really simple query plan. It's a, it's a table scan of A followed by this selection operator. So if you think about what's, what's happening here, let's say we have three uh, workers that we want to split this, this processing across. So we're going to have uh, a smaller table scan, A1, A2, A3, that are going to read disjoint uh, partitions of table A. And then the selections can proceed in parallel and then they're all gonna get fed up to this uh, exchange operator at the end. So imagine we have these table A on the, the disk pages stored down here and we have each one of these are a fragment. So again, there are three split up across three workers. And basically what, what the exchange operator is going to do is going to call next on each of its child fragments. So it has to call next three times here it's going to call next to the first fragment. Then, you know, the, the uh, selection operator for the first fragment is going to call next on the table scan. And that proceeds as usual. So in order to, to perform the table scan, uh, this first fragment, a, a one table scan here, is going to pull out uh, the first page from, from uh, the table A on disk. And then sort of the, the same thing happens for the other uh, two fragments. We are, they're going to pull out the second and third pages from disk. So uh, this again sort of proceeds as usual. They're gonna they're gonna keep processing. Uh, when when they're done um, working on whatever they're working on. So let's say A1 and A2 finish. A3 is still working. Uh, there A, A2 and A1 can grab the next uh, pages from from disk. So here uh, let's say you know A2 finished a little bit before A1. It can just grab the next the next one on disk. Uh, so there is some, some coordination going on here. Um, we, we want each uh, fragment to get a disjoint subset, so we have to make sure that, for example, A1 and A2 don't both grab page four, uh, so maybe some kind of counter or something that points to the next page. But um, at, at a high level, uh, the, the, the different options are the same. So you know, we could use that mechanism, we could use some kind of uh, partitioning mechanism, for example, a1 takes uh, you know, every mod three, so it's gonna get one, four, et cetera. A2 is gonna get two, five, et cetera. Um, the, you know, the, and that, then you don't have to keep track of the, the current next page. But um, the, the, for, for the purposes of, of the um, exchange operator, uh, it, it doesn't really care about that, that low level abstraction. We just need to make sure whatever uh, our, our scan method is, we're not uh, having two fragments work on uh, the same range or the same 
pages. They need to be disjoint subsets of pages. And there are multiple different ways of doing that. So uh, are there any questions about how um, this approach works? Yes. So the, uh, the question is, is this actually parallel or is it concurrent? Um, so I, I think it, it uh, so it, I, I think that maybe the, the confusion is about whether or not the exchange operator is blocking on the next call. So uh, in this case, no, calls to, to next in the exchange operator are going to be non-blocking. So you're going to be able to call next and then this fragment here is going to be able to fill up its you know, whatever buffer it needs to fill up to, or maybe it's a single tuple, whatever. But uh, the exchange operator is going to call um, uh, next, next, next on each of its uh, children and then wait. And in, in that sense, then you can have the, the child workers executing independently of each other. But uh, it is correct. If, if exchange were blocking, I guess, on each next call, then there would be no uh, benefit to this, right? You'd, you'd just be executing, you know, three things uh, serially here. Um, but for that reason, yeah. So exchange is going to call next for each child and it's not going to block. It's going to let those execute um, in, in parallel. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions? Okay, so uh, I mentioned um, there were different types of exchange operators depending on if you want to um, uh, coalesce or split. So the, the one that we saw in the previous slide uh, was a, uh, this first type here, a gather, which is basically going to be combining the results from multiple workers into a single output stream. So in that example, uh, we want to collect all of the uh, results from our, our different selection operators or our selection fragments and then put those into some final output stream to return to the, the user application. So that's a gather operation. Um, the, the second type is a distributed operation, which is basically you're going to take a single input stream and you're going to split it up into multiple streams, uh, multiple output streams that could be handled in parallel. So, uh, you know, imagine that, that we have one particular uh, scan that's happening. We want to, you know, kind of split those out into multiple parallel scans. So that's what the distributed operator would be. In this repartition one um, is basically where we're shuffling multiple input streams uh, across multiple out output streams. So maybe the, the, um, uh, in the, the previous example with the, the uh, selections here, we have these three selections coming in and maybe we want to partition them for some reason into, into different um, uh, outputs based on their keys. So we can split them up in different outputs and then uh, each worker in the, the next layer of the, the parallel execution is going to have all of the keys uh, associated with that particular partition. So that's kind of that uh, uh, type three, repartitioning. So you have multiple inputs and then they get partitioned based on some logic um, and then they get, they get split up into multiple outputs. So um, the, the uh, things get a little more complicated when uh, we have sort of this uh, uh, more complex operators in here like a join. So um, for example here we're going to have the, the uh, uh, scan on A so we know how to you know split that one up. We can split A up into these these different uh, uh, worker fragments that can scan in parallel on A. Uh, we'll assign them to their, their different workers there and you know we can we can execute this selection in parallel. We saw how that works uh, because the, um, uh, the, the different disjoint sub-ranges or sub-pages that we're working on aren't going to conflict with each other. We can work on them completely in parallel. Um, and actually, we can also do, do one other thing. We can take this projection operator. So what's the projection doing? It's just filtering out to only AID and B value that we need at the end. So we can push that all the way down. Um, we'll see more about that when we talk about query optimization um, in, I, I think it's the, the next lecture, uh, next, next week. But um, basically, 
it's pretty straightforward how to split up all of these um, uh, different fragments. So, you know, the scan, we saw those can work on different, different pages, that's fine. The selection, uh, we're just filtering out values from each page, that's fine. Uh, and the projection, we're just cutting it down to only the columns we care about. But, um, you know, how, when we get to this join, what are we gonna do? Because, you know, the join is building some, some data structure that's gonna be shared between all of these different uh, um, fragments. So, uh, sort of one way to think about it is to build these independent hash tables that we're doing here. Um, so each, each pipeline builds up its own independent hash table, each fragment has its own hash table, and then we use this exchange operator to combine them into one giant hash table. Uh, another option is, you know, the, the, to, to implement some kind of uh, concurrent data structure, concurrent hash table that all of these fragments can be updating, inserting into at the same time. So we need this exchange operator here to kind of whatever method we choose uh, to, to uh, combine these, these different outputs from these scans together and uh, feed them into the join. So this, this exchange operator sort of has that uh, uh, staging area where it can get all these results together um, and the, the gather implement or the, the, the uh, gather operator and present one final unified stream that goes out to the uh, join. Now on the other side, so that's, that's fine, we build up that whole side of the, the uh, query tree and now we have to do the probe side of the join. So again, we can execute this, this sub piece in parallel and that's, that's great. When we get up here, now we're just doing reads into our hash table. So those can all execute independently. So they're going to be all emitting tuples independently based on probes into the hash table. We don't have to worry about combining any results here. We're gonna put the exchange operator after the join. It's gonna take the three values that are coming out of the probe. So each one of these fragments produces um, its own output and that's going to get streamed to this exchange operator. It's going to combine them into the final uh, output for the, the user. So are there any questions about kind of this more complex example? Yes. So what does the exchange operator operate on? Like, I mean, give me an operator on the tuple, but here it's also operating on hash table chunks. So the question is, what does the exchange operator operate on? So, uh, you, you need to implement a, a different exchange operator depending on what it is you're trying to uh, exchange or combine. So in this case, we need to have um, some kind of logic for combining together the output of this build hash table side, the build side of the join. Uh, on the other side, uh, it's just you know the streaming output of, of the tuples. We're just combining those tuples, essentially merging them into a single output stream. So you need to have some kind of logic somewhere built into an operator that tells you for each potential output from a, a, a query uh, how, to, how to combine them. I guess uh, technically you, you could, um, you know, uh, you, you could skip the build hash table thing in parallel. Well, uh, so there's two options. One is you could skip the build hash table thing in parallel, just use one concurrent hash table that everything's running into. Then you don't have that exchange there, I mean, I guess, sort of the exchange logic is implemented in the concurrent data structure. Um, the other option is uh, not to parallelize the build hash table part at all, just cut it off at the projection, and now uh, sort of similar to the right side, everything is being uh, gathered into a single output stream, and then you have one operator that, that builds the hash table. So uh, there are different options there. Uh, I think the, the, the current state of the art is, um, Although there's, there's different people who, who say different things, but the, the current state of the art, uh, the, the biggest consensus is around building these multiple hash tables and then combining them into, um, partitioning into, into separate hash tables and then uh, combining them that way. So um, does that answer the question? Are there any other questions? Okay, so that was intra-operator parallelism. Um, Inter-operator parallelism, uh, or sometimes called vertical parallelism, uh, sometimes also called pipeline parallelism, we'll see why in a second, but uh, the idea is that operations rather than uh, the, the different pieces of the query plan, rather than breaking those up in smaller uh, tasks or fragments, the operations are going to be overlapped in order to pipeline data from one stage to the next without materializing it. 
That's why it's called pipeline parallelism sometimes. So each worker, you can think about executing um, an individual operator uh, or potentially multiple operators from a segment of the query plan at the same time. So visually what this looks like, again, let's say we have the same uh, query here. We're gonna split it up into uh, different pieces. So let's take the join. We're gonna split that up, assign one worker to process the join part. It's just gonna be running in this loop uh, doing the join. So let's say it's just a, a nested loop join here. Um, it's just gonna keep going in, in the loop and emitting the, the join matches. And then we're going to have a separate worker that's just doing the projection. So every time it gets a result from uh, the, the join operator, it's going to, it's going to apply the projection and, and pass that out to the result set. Now, the, the challenge here is that, you know, since the, the join operators probably a, a little more complicated than the projection operator, um, the, the projection operator might be idle or blocking a lot of the time. So, uh, you know, we have this projection sitting around not doing very much, the join's taking a lot longer, so we don't necessarily have uh, equal utilization across our parallel workers. Whereas in the other, the other example, you know, everyone, all of the workers were always busy working on some subfragment. In this case, um, if there are differing amounts of work that each worker has to do, some might be idle while some are, uh, were blocked waiting for. So kind of one, one way around this is this bushy parallelism idea where you have a hybrid of uh, intra and interoperator uh, parallelism where uh, you, know, you can kind of group them together in a way uh, potentially to balance the amount of work that each, each worker is doing. And in this case, we're still gonna need the exchange operator here in order to combine intermediate results from each segment. So just as a, as a simple example, uh, this query um, looks something like this in the query plan and we could split it up into using a, a combination of intra and inter query parallelism to get kind of a partitioning like this. So we're gonna have uh, you know, one worker doing the join between A and B, another worker doing the join between C and D, and then those can go through the exchange um, and, and go to the final, the final join at the end. So we wanna kind of uh, split up, partition up all of our work into these different uh, groups where we can get you know, uh, inter-query and intra-query parallelism. We've broken down individual operators and we've also broken down um, the, the uh, workers working on uh, different pieces of the, the plan. So uh, again, I think this is just a, a generalization of, of the other two. Uh, if, you, if you can do intra-query and inter-query, you can arrange them sort of in arbitrary ways um, to get an arbitrary split um, across the, the different workers that you have. Uh, so are there any questions about any of these uh, parallel processing paradigms? Okay, so uh, one important thing to note is, you know, we've been talking about how to split up parallel processing, parallel execution, um, but using all of this parallelism, using these different workers to execute queries won't necessarily help if the disk is always gonna be the main bottleneck. So if you're doing something really expensive, like an expensive aggregation or a, a join or something where there's a lot of you know, in-memory work going on, then sure, uh, parallelism is gonna help you, but if you're always waiting around on disk I.O., then you know, it's not gonna make things any better. And in fact, if you have um, competing workers doing uh, you're trying to work on different segments of the disk at the same time, you can actually, uh, through, through parallelizing the work, uh, make things worse because now you have uh, disk I.O. that's competing with all these workers sitting around trying to get different things from disk um, and, and that, that can lead to bigger problems than if you just executed things uh, serially in a, in a single thread. So that leads us to kind of this idea of I.O. parallelism where we're going to split the DBMS across multiple storage devices. So um, there are many, many different ways of doing this. I've listed a few here. For example, you can have multiple disks per database. Uh, you can split up, if you have multiple disks, you can have one database per disk. You can have one relation per disk. You know, each table gets on a separate disk. Uh, you can split a relation across multiple disks, many other versions of this, but um, basically the idea is if you have multiple disks, there are different ways that we can take advantage of them. So, um, one one uh, uh, way is to configure either the OS or the hardware to store DBMS's files across multiple storage devices. 
So this can be either implemented in some kind of uh, hardware mechanism, so it's like a storage appliance, or uh, through, through RAID configuration. How many people are, are familiar or know about RAID? Okay, so uh, RAID stands for Redundant Array of uh, Inexpensive, I think was the original term, or Independent Disks, uh, whichever you prefer. But um, basically the idea is that it's like a, a data storage virtualization where we, we have all of these different disks, uh, multiple storage devices, and they're going to appear as a single logical device. So imagine multiple physical disks, but they're going to appear uh, as a single logical disk to the DBMS. So it's, it's, everything is transparent to the DBMS. So again, you know, we have our DBMS executing there. Um, there are different ways of splitting up uh, the, the, the files. So this is, is RAID 0. Um, it is called uh, striping. So basically we're, we're splitting up the pages of the file that we have. Page 1 and page 4 go on our, our first disk. Page 2 and page 5 go on the second. Page 3 and page 6 go on the uh, third disk. So basically we're, we're taking our pages in our file and we're transparently, to the, this is important, transparently to the DBMS partitioning them up across all of these different um, uh, physical disks. So uh, this, is, this is RAID 0. The, uh, another common, there, there are a million you know, RAID configurations. The other common one um, is, is RAID 1, uh, which is mirroring where you're going to uh, uh, duplicate the pages across each of the disks. So imagine we have um, you know, a file with three pages, or sorry, two pages. We're going to replicate page one and page two on every uh, independent disk that we have. So uh, when, when do you think that uh, RAID 0 will help? What kinds of operations in our DBMS is, is RAID 0 configuration going to help with? Yes? Right, exactly, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of summarize. Uh, the, the answer was that if you have a, a, you know, a file or a, a table that's uh, uh, particularly important, a hot, it's uh, hot to the application, so it's getting access frequently, and you have um, the, the file split up, uh, its pages across multiple disks, you get higher overall bandwidth, right? There's more, there's more bandwidth for us to read in the pages um, from each of these disks uh, at the same time, that's right. So how about writes? What do you think, is this, is this gonna be, so the read is okay, yeah. What, what's gonna happen with writes? Is it gonna be better or worse than if we have a single disk? Right, so the, the answer is that writes will also be better because you can write uh, to multiple separate disks. So you, you'll get higher bandwidth both in, in reads and write queries. So how about read one here? Um, What's it going to look like for for reads and writes? Yeah. Exactly. So the, the answer is reads will be good, and because we're we're getting more you know overall bandwidth, where we can we can access um, uh, uh, pages from any disk we want, right? Uh, but writes are going to be to be slower because now we have to replicate it to all of the, the individual disks. So um, there are different trade-offs you have to consider. Uh, here also, you know, in the, the RAID 0, uh, if, if we lose one of our disks, let's say one of our disks fails, or, or we have one of our files become corrupted, or one of our pages become corrupted, um, there's no redundancy. There's no way to recover it because uh, the, the file is partitioned in that way. Um, here, you know, we ha we, if one of the disks fails, then we're okay still because uh, we have two other disks that, that have the file replicated. So there are different trade-offs you have to consider in, in terms of all these things. I mean, there, there, again, as I said, there are a million of these kind of RAID arrangements. You can combine RAID 0 and 1, so you have both uh, striping and mirroring, uh, all different things. But the, the specifics of, of all the different RAID configurations don't matter for uh, our purposes, which is important is that 
Um, all of this is happening transparently to the DBMS. So the DBMS doesn't know about, about um, what's happening here. Sort of all of the advantages that we're getting either from striping or mirroring are happening, happening at a layer below what the DBMS knows is going on. So the DBMS just sees one logical uh, disk that, that has you know, the higher throughput uh, or latency um, advantages that, that RAID gives you. So are there any questions about uh, this? Okay, so uh, I want to talk quickly about partitioning and then um, a few minutes for the, the midterm stuff. So um, database partitioning, uh, some DBMSs allow you to kind of specify the disk location of, of, an indivi of each individual database that you have. Um, and then the, the buffer pool manager is going to map you know, pages to specific disks. So you don't have to kind of worry at the application level you know, where um, your individual files are stored. The, the DBMS kind of handles the mapping uh, to these different par partitions. And it's easy to do kind of at the file system level if you know that your DBMS splits up uh, files into different directories or something. Uh, the, the one thing that, that we still need to, to care about is the recovery log um, that, that we might have to have, you know, if a transaction um, can update uh, uh, the multiple databases in one transaction, uh, then we might have to care about recovering that uh, from the recovery log. But uh, don't worry about that for now. We're going to talk about uh, you know, the, the properties of transactions and recovery and all that stuff in, in future lectures. So um, basically the high level idea of partitioning is that we're going to split a single logical table into these disjoint physical segments and we're going to store them or manage them separately uh, from each other. So we're going to Rather than something transparent like RAID that we're getting from the hardware, the DBMS is specifically going to, at, at the, the uh, uh, table level, it's going to, to take a single logical table and it's going to split it up into these different physical pieces and then it's going to, to know uh, how it's storing them and manage them independently. So uh, where, where the RAID stuff was um, transparent to the DBMS, partitioning should ideally be transparent to the end user application. So the DBMS can do kind of whatever kind of physical partitioning it wants, but you writing your SQL query shouldn't have to know that, that a table is partitioned in some particular way. It should all be uh, abstracted away and it, it should look like to the application or the SQL query that um, the, all of the, all of the, the data in the table lives in one logical table. So there's this abstraction layer of how exactly physically the data is stored. So I'll just give a few quick uh, uh, examples of partitioning. So one example is vertical partitioning. Um, you can think about this like the, the uh, uh, column store model that we talked about, DSM storage model. Um, basically, we're storing a table's attributes in, in separate locations. So it could be a separate file, disk volume, disk, whatever, uh, but we're, we need to have some, um, just like in the column store example, we need to have some metadata that tells us how to, to reconstruct the original record. So an example here uh, of, of partitioning is, let's say you know we have these three attributes, attribute one, two, and three, and those get read together uh, frequently, and they're ints, and they're easy to store uh, in a fixed length, and then we have this attribute four, which is text string data, uh, and it's a lot harder to, to store and it doesn't get accessed as frequently as the other three. So what we can do is physically uh, split up or partition uh, this table into two separate pieces. So we have partition one contains all of the attributes that we access together uh, frequently and partition two contains uh, the, the text data separately. And again, um, the, ideally this should all be transparent to the end user the application, uh, they, they don't need to know that the data is physically stored like this. This can be done behind the scenes by the DBMS. The other uh, alternative is horizontal partitioning, uh, and this gets done frequently uh, in distributed DBMSs, but um, it also has other advantages for splitting up things in, um, in uh, local parallel settings. But, Basically, we're going to divide the table up into these just disjoint segments based on some partitioning uh, strategy. So uh, we can either use like hash partitioning on the, the keys or the values. We can use range partitioning. We can use you know, predicate partitioning. So if uh, 
the, the tuples match some particular predicate or, or uh, they're in some particular range or something, we can split them all up uh, into to disjoint subsets. So um, uh, here we would get, you know, maybe let's say we did range partitioning or something, we'd get uh, partition number one has tuples one and two in it, and partition number two has tuples three and four. Now those are stored separately, but again, they all exist in one logical table. So we'll, we'll talk more about this when we uh, talk about distributed um, databases. Okay, so are there any questions about uh, partitioning or, or how any of that works? Okay, so uh, to just wrap up what we talked about today, uh, parallel execution is, is especially important, which is why almost every major DBMS supports it. They don't all necessarily support all types of um, parallelism. For example, uh, you can have multiple queries running concurrently. I think MySQL, for example, lets you run multiple queries concurrently. Uh, MySQL is very popular, but there's no intra-query parallelism, so they can't parallelize like a, a, you know, a scan or a join that's running inside a single query, but they, they do allow multiple queries to run at the same time. So um, it's, it's hard to get right for a lot of reasons. Uh, you, there's coordination overhead, there's scheduling problems, concurrency issues, if you have multiple readers and writers uh, going at the same time, you have to, to care about that sort of stuff. Uh, and there's also this problem of resource contention, so figuring out how best to allocate the resources that you have uh, in, in the, the parallel setting. So, okay, are there any final questions about parallel execution and then uh, midterm? Okay, so the midterm exam. Uh, who is it for, all of you? Uh, what is it, the midterm exam? Uh, it is here in this room, um, and it will be on Wednesday, October 13th, so it's in a couple days. Uh, it is in the usual class time, so it's, it's uh, an hour and 20 minutes, or whatever that is. Uh, the why is sort of a more uh, existential question I can answer for you. Uh, your best bet is to watch this video. Um, that may have some of the answers you're after. Uh, and uh, it, there's, a, there's a Piazza post, and I think it will link you to uh, this midterm exam guide um, where we have some just general reminders, information about the exam, um, and a, a, a practice exam with solutions. So the uh, exam will cover all of the lecture material up to and including today. So parallel query execution will be the last topic. So it could be anything from lecture one, the first lecture, all the way up to lecture number 12 today. Uh, as I mentioned, it's open book, open notes, whatever paper material you want. Please know electronic devices that have an internet connection. Uh, calculator's fine. Not the calculator on your phone, uh, because then you just be using your phone. Um, so specifically, uh, what to bring your CMU ID. Uh, so we're gonna check when, when we collect the exams, so you need your CMU ID. Uh, a calculator, unless, as I said, you're, you're really good at mental math for logs. Or, uh, and a, a, a pen or pencil. Pencils are recommended, so what we're gonna do is it, it's going to be all um, multiple choice. We're gonna fill in the answers and then we're gonna uh, uh, scan them in and, and auto grade them. Um, so pencil is, is preferable uh, unless you're, you're really confident in, in your answers um, and use a pen, I guess. But uh, a pencil and, and erasers if you wanna change your answer during uh, the exam. So uh, that's everything I have. Um, are there any sp specific questions about uh, the exam, the, the format, the content, any of that kind of stuff? So the, the question is for the multiple choice, uh, do you have to fully fill in the, the box? Yes, there's gonna be little boxes. You need to fill it in as fully and you know darkly as possible, so that way uh, the, the scanner will pick it up when, when we scan it in. Uh, and I, again, I mean, if, if there's a problem where you, know, it, you filled in an answer and it doesn't quite pick it up or whatever, then you just, just let us know and we'll, we'll regrade it um, with that. Yes? Uh, 
the, the question is, will there be partial credit for scratch work or will the final score be the final score? Um, so uh, I, I would suggest this. Uh, fill in whatever your answer is. If, if you think um, there's some aspect of the question, or if, if there's some explanation you want to give about the answer, uh, write it in next to it. Don't do this for every question, but if there's if there's one something in particular where that you think is um, you know extenuating for a particular question, write in either notes or your scratch work or whatever uh, explaining your answer. And uh, if if you ask for a, a regrade request on that particular question, then we'll we'll take a look. But again, don't don't write out all of your work for every question and assume you're going to get some kind of uh, partial credit. Just uh, Fill in the answers as best you can, and if there's something really in particular that you want to write out uh, an answer for, uh, you can fill it in next to that question. Yes? So the, the question is, uh, if there are multi-part questions uh, and they incorporate or they rely on answers from previous parts of the question, um, how will that work, right? As far as I know, uh, and I will double check again, uh, there are no multi-part questions like that. So every question should be able to be answered independently. Uh, I, will, I will double check and make sure that that's the case. And if it's not, I will edit it so it will be the case. But uh, each, each sub-question or each part to each question should be independent of all the other parts. So there, there won't be a case where like, you know, there's a 10-part question and you get the first part wrong, so now you get the next nine right. That's the, all, all of them are going to be independent. Are there any other questions? Final chance. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, one more. Uh, so the question is, if if uh, all notes and books are in the tablet, can you bring it? Uh, you can bring it. You just can't use it. Uh, so no electronic devices. Nothing with uh, an internet connection. Uh, if you want to print them out or you want to hand write out notes based on it, then that's fine. But uh, no electronic devices outside of a calculator um, during the exam. OK, so if there are no more questions, then I will see you all on Wednesday. About the St. Ives Brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. For a mic check, bust it. The fuse all set, then grab a 40. The flim New York and snap his neck. St. Ives, take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40s getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E trouble, get us a St. Ives Brew on the double.